Yeah, so I'm Will, and um, as other speakers have, I'll uh, introduce myself a little bit. Um, I'm a local graduate. I graduated with a PhD at the University of Canterbury, um, had had our reception in this room. Um, yeah, big, big hall over there somewhere. Yeah, walked up on stage, and, and they, they shook my hand, and I walked off again. Um, so much for four years. Um, so, yeah, my PhD was in redundant number systems um, and implementing them in FPGAs. Um, so what does that mean? It means I have a PhD in how to add two numbers together. Um, it's, yeah, you do lots of things with redundant numbers when you don't have the same number of digits as the bases in your number. Um, it's It's a lot of fun and I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, I finished PhD, moved to Hamilton, um, which is where I'm still living, um, and worked for Endace, a networking company, network monitoring company, um, using FPGAs to capture network packets and stuff. Um, and then an opportunity came up to join the SKA, um, which is a fantastic project. Um, so I had, had various roles, um, and while sort of staying on the same project, just different people give me money to keep me on the project, which is nice. Um, so in 2015, AUT employed me. Um, and then um, during COVID, uh, the National Research Council of Canada employed me. Um, and I didn't move to Canada, so they couldn't keep employing me. Um, so now I'm a contractor to the contractor to NRC who contracts to the SKA. So I'm well down the chain, so whatever I say, um, don't take that as official language. Um, so, yeah, 2022, I started my own uh, consulting company, Computed Limited, um, and work from Hamilton, telecommuting to Canada every day. Um, after hours, this is things I do. I play hockey. Um, I like to fly, but since COVID haven't, hasn't, because lack of time you can't you can't fly part-time not a good idea um but in two two weeks time i'll be playing a masters hockey tournament in wellington so i'll be back to wellington in february so not too bad um and a little bit of gardening on the side uh, bottom left is my my latest crop um so that i'll tell you about my new hobby next year um and with my brother i've uh, been telecommuting and working from home for, for seven years and got sick of that. So we bought an office and my new job is now renovating an office. Um, and uh, uh, down here we have uh, Hamilton's oldest public artwork, uh, which is now in my possession uh, from 1956. Yeah. Oh, and picture up here I put in for David. Um, so this is me uh, measuring the ceiling um, using a piece of three millimeter solder uh, builder's solder and you can you can map your map your ceiling in 3d and then transfer it to to your piece of plywood that you're trying to fit up into those gaps a lot of work um, but looks awesome yeah so my day job is working on the square kilometer array radio telescope um the official line is one observatory, two telescopes, and three continents. Um, there used to be three telescopes, and b between me being offered my job and me uh, moving to AUT, um, that third telescope, the survey telescope, was, was cut. It was no more. Um, so I almost didn't have a job again. Um, but fortunately, I was, I was put into the correlated teams of... Um, the mid telescope and the low telescope. So mid is led by the Canadians and the low telescope by CSIRO in Australia. Um, so at the moment we're building SKA1, which is 10% of the square kilometre. So that's 1 million square metres. Um, and we have a budget of about 700 million euros to build this thing. Um, and most of that goes into civil work. Um, and then SKA2, which is somewhere in the future and some timeline, um, and has some budget. Um, I don't know if you extrapolate, maybe you'll get close. 
Um, but that's very much in the future, but I'm looking forward to that too. Um, so a million square meters, um, how big is that? That's really big, right? So here is Christchurch. Um, you can find multi-core world. This is, this is the, the room we're in here. Um, and if you go for a 40 minute walk, you might walk around the city and that'd be a million square meters. Um, SKA1 is the, is the box up here. Um, so that's where we're going. And in 2024, we'll, we'll have this box, hopefully. Um, and just for reference, the largest radio telescope in the world, a, a single dish radio telescope is the fast telescope in China, which is the, uh, 500 meter spherical aperture, uh, telescope, something like that. Um, so it's a 500 meter wide dish. Uh, but the receiver can only illuminate 300 meters of it, a 300 meter diameter, the smaller circle there. Um, and that allows them to steer the dish around the sky a little bit. Um, so the SKA is going to be huge. Um, and the SKA-1 will compete very strongly with all other telescopes in the world. Um, so there is two telescopes. There's SKA Low, um, which is going to be located in the Murchison Shire of Western Australia. Um, currently, there's the MWA and the ASCAP telescopes there currently. Um, and the low refers to the low frequency range that it's going to be sensitive to, which is 50 to 350 megahertz. So it's only 300 megahertz of bandwidth. Um, in SKA1, there will be 131,072 antennas in the Australian outback. Um, so it's 2 to the power of 17 for, for the computer nerds. Um, so, And that'll be 512 stations of 256 antennas um, spread out over about 65 kilometres of area. Um, and those stations, they look something like this um, with these Christmas tree antenna things. So they're put out in the desert, have a power supply, fiber optic links. This is, this is a real photo. Yeah, yeah. So this is a drone shot. Um, and yeah, I think they've got a couple of stations now built. Um, so they're, they're moving towards their first array release, which I think is six stations. And I work on the mid telescope now, um, designing the correlator. Um, that's going to be located in the Karoo Desert in South Africa. Um, has a frequency range of 350, so where the low telescope leaves off up to 15.4 gigahertz. Um, and there's five frequency bands in there, so we look at a certain chunk of bandwidth within there. Um, and our largest bandwidth is five gigahertz. Um, simultaneously looking at five gigahertz on the sky, so right up at the 15.4 gigahertz end. Um, so we're going to have 197 dishes, um, which is a prime number because someone's funny. Um, so we're going to build 133 new dishes, and then we're going to add 64 dishes from the Meerkat telescope. Um, and we'll have a an aperture of 150 kilometers once we've, we've completed SKA-1. Um, um, so... These are the dishes here. Um, this dish exists, and they call this one Scampi. So this is now an operating telescope as of early this year uh, with their first light image here. So this is pointing the dish over the sky, measuring the power, and just rasterizing over the sky. So that's what a, a single dish telescope does. Um, um, and yeah, pretty cool landscape in, in the Karoo. Um, I'm looking forward to visiting there if I can if I can organise that. Um, what's the point? Um, making pretty pictures for presentations. Um, so you can. Um, so this is, I think this is a black hole with radio jets um, extending out into space, millions of of light years across. Um, amazing stuff and that side there's a supernova in the middle there um with i think they call that the mouse shooting out from it and they they think that is the 
the binary companion star um, of the one that exploded. So his friend went, boop, so he ran off in, into intergalactic space. Um, and the one at the bottom in the grayscale and the, and the yellow in the middle, that's, that's our galaxy. That's the center of our galaxy in radio. Um, and you can see features like supernova in the, in the bottom right corner there. Um, um, this, I took a screenshot of the SKA website. It's an amazing website. Um, this is, these are three of the science goals. I think there's five, um, including looking for aliens, um, because that gets you money. Um, but interesting things like probing the, the, the cosmic dawn. So the, the start of the, just after the big bang, what happened, um, um, the dawn of the of the epoch of reionization comes soon after, which is the birth of the first stars, and the stars start um, ionizing the neutral hydrogen that was left over after the Big Bang. Um, everyone likes to challenge Einstein. Um, so far, nobody's been successful, but the SKA is going to try. Um, that's looking at at pulsar stars orbiting black holes and testing relativity in extreme gravitational environments and, and fun things like that. Um, and cosmolo cosmology and dark energy, so that dark matter thing that you hear about, and dark energy, which is making our universe expand. Um, what the hell is it? Where did it come from? Um, is it going away? All those sorts of big questions. Um so the SKA is going to be bigger and better than anything that was built before um, in all possible dimensions, um, which is a great engineering challenge because they want to do everything and do it the best. Um, so we've got other telescopes down here. So in the Netherlands, the LOFAR telescope, um, which has got stations across Europe, um, do low-frequency stuff quite well. Um, so this is their, their sensitivity. Um, Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope is in India. Um, it's had a recent upgrade, I believe. And the Jansky Very Large Array um, in the US, which is famous for movies like Contact and and things like that. Um, they SETI runs on that and all sorts. It's, um, it's a big telescope, and the Canadians also built the correlator, or the upgraded correlator for that uh, that telescope too. So SK1 will have a greater sensitivity due to the greater collecting area of the dishes. Um, and SK2 will have even more dishes, uh, 10 times as many more dishes. So that sensitivity will go up, which means you can see fainter and fainter objects. Um, and then they also talk about survey speed. So how fast can you look across the sky? How often can you survey the sky? Um, so greater sensitivity helps with that and then being able to move your telescopes and do the signal processing faster um, helps as well. Um, so I work in this thing called the central signal processor. So we get um, data from the dishes out in the Karoo Desert. Um, they're sampling as hard and fast as they can and we get we get 100 gigabits per second line rate across an ethernet from those dishes um, and that's running 24 7 um, we won't get a break and that all streams into the correlator so if you multiply out the number of dishes by the data rate you get about two terabytes per second of data coming into the front end of our machine um, continuously um, and we have to process that in real time because you can't store that um, Traditionally, you would in a radio telescope, but we can't store any of that. So we have to correlate that on the fly. Um, what's here? Um, so our, the correlator takes each of those dishes and mashes them, mashes each of those signals together um, in pairs. So there's N squared pairs of data. So there's a huge amount of puke, puke we have to do for all of that data. Um, and then, so we produce these things called visibilities, um, and those visibilities get sent to the next supercomputer, which is more like what you guys are, are used to. It's a it's a big HPC machine sitting in a data center 
um, trying to turn the visibilities into images. And that'll all be GPU processing and, and such. Um, so this is our hardware. Um, this is a, a Talon DX board. Um, we have a dirty great Stratix 10 FPGA sitting under here with all its power supplies. Um, communications, so I've got 100 gig coming in up here and going out on the other side. And then we've got uh, these midboard optic modules, which each do 25 gigabit per second times 12 lanes. Um, so there's 56 lanes of of data um, going out there. Um, so unfortunately, this is going going bye bye this year. We'll build a couple of correlators with it, the first couple of stages, and then we're going to do a technology refresh. Um, so this was designed by um, NRC um, in Canada, the National Research Council, um, 26 layer boards and lots of high speed IO and things, um, lots of DRAM, uh, DDR4, and we've got a big 256 gig stick in there. Um, a huge heat sink to go on the side, which we're having trouble sourcing more of. Um, and we fit two of those into a rack unit, which is uh, 2U high. Um, and we'll, uh, the, the full SKA1 plan was to have 700 of those boxes um, in our correlator. Um, so this is the plan. Um, array assembly 0 0.5, which is our four-dish array, our very initial array is due to be completed in February 2024. Um, so I've got a lot of work to do this afternoon. Um, um, and then, yeah, every every year or so, we make the next release. So AA1 will be eight dishes, and then we'll add 64, then we'll get to 133, and then we'll incorporate the Meerkat telescope. Um, and everything will be done by the July 2029. Um, Yes. But we, we haven't slipped at all. I joined the project in 2015 and we were doing design and we got supposed to get to our critical design review in 2016 and then construction would start in 2018. Um, we started construction 2022. Um, yeah, so as these projects go, um, things slip um, and I largely blame the politicians. Um, oh, this is kind of cool. So, this is the center of the array, which is where most of the most of the dishes are, and they just sort of randomly, pseudo randomly placed um, in space. But then we have these um, logarithmic spiral arms that that come out, um, and yeah, they're spaced such that there's fewer um, uh, errors in the image that you produce. Um, so when you look at radio images from uh, the Jansky B BLA, um, you'll see these these triangle shapes in your stars, and that comes from the triangular shape of the the dishes layout. They're all on on tracks in a in a triangular star. So they're trying to minimise the the errors based on how the array is laid out. Um, Um, so, what does a correlator do? Um, so there's two ways of building a correlator. Um, there's the XF method and the FX method. Um, so the X is the cross-correlation, so bringing each of the antennas together um, and, and correlating them. Um, and the F is the Fourier transform part, so breaking it out into channels. Um, so... First, the first radio telescopes were XF telescopes, um, and then someone worked out you can do parallelism if you use the convolution theorem and do your F first. So we we channelize the the signals coming in, we break them up into very small frequency bands, and that gives us our embarrassingly parallel compute problem. Um, so then we can just go through and multiply them, and we get to our our visibilities at the bottom. Um, yeah, so the cor correlator is the is the blast furnace of 
the SKA. Um, so we cross multiply each dish with every other dish. Um, so with 200 antennas, um, multiply that by two because each antenna has two polarizations of, of radio waves they receive, the X and Y polarization. So that looks like 400 antennas to the correlator. Um, and you multiply that by N, you square that, and that's the number of cross multipliers you need to do. Um, and after you've cross multiplied, then you accumulate and uh, you bring the signal level up or you beat the noise down by the central limit theorem. So we accumulate about 2,000 samples together um, to produce our visibilities at a rate of about 7 a second. Um, and low, low is even worse. They have uh, 1,024 polarizations to correlate. Um, so n squared on that is is huge. Um, yeah, that's a, yeah, a million, a million samples to output, but much lower bandwidths. Um, yeah, so SKA two, ten times more antennas, which means a hundred times more compute we're going to have to do. Um, so hopefully uh, technology will improve in the next few years. Um, so now I get geeky and back to my PhD and how to how to do numbers. Um, so the correlator only needs to do a 9-bit cross-multiply, and most of that 9 bits is headroom for radio frequency interference. Um, so 9 bits is actually a luxury um, so this is this is New Zealand's largest radio telescope um, up in Walkworth, uh, 50 kilometres north of of Auckland. Uh, kind of cool to go and visit. Um, used to be operated by AUT, but is now an independent company, um, and they do one bit sampling of their radio signal, um, and they sample that and store it on disk. And then they ship that disk off to the correlator somewhere in Australia or in Europe. Um, so that's how things like the um, the black hole telescope, the what do they call that, um, the Event Horizon Telescope, is a bunch of these dishes. One down in Antarctica, they they record the signal to disk, um, and then someone transports that disk onto a ship, and that ship goes to Europe, and then they spend two years correlating the data um, to produce those cool cool black hole, hole images. Um, um, yeah, so SKA mid, we have five bands, as I said before, um, with between 12 bits or about uh, nine bits ENOB uh, effective bits and three bits at our, at our highest sampling rate. Um, and that's so we can fit into that 100 gig pipe. Um, and so the correlators only have to operate with a, a 9-bit complex multiply. Um, and I, we also have a mode where we store the last 60 seconds of data that each each antenna come, well, gives us, and we put that into a circular buffer with only 2-bit resolution. Um, so you can do a lot of science with just 2 bits worth of of data. Um, so FPGAs, they give us these nice hardened multiplier blocks. Um, so in the Intel Stratix 10, you can have two 18-bit multipliers or one 27-bit multiplier. Um, odd numbers, but that's sort of floating point precision. Um, and in the Ultra Scale Plus, so the Xilinx, the competitors, um, you get an 18 by 27 signed multiplier. So these chips roughly have five, six thousand multipliers in them for you to use, um, but we have to do a lot of complex multiplication. Um, so yeah, up here we have our two antennas. We do some frequency um, channelization, and then we cross multiply and accumulate in the sum for two thousand samples, and then we dump out our visibility um, so this this multiply we need lots and lots and lots of those um, so there's two ways of doing uh, complex multiplication you can do the, the Cartesian way um, which is 
what most of you will have seen as school, but there's also the Karatsuba multiplication where you can replace one multiplication by a couple of additions instead and, and use this stuff. Um, but that doesn't save you. It's, it's not enough of a reduction in number of multipliers. Um, so if you just use 9-bit multipliers and assign each of those to your 18 plus 18-bit multiplier, then you're, you're only using 25% of that multiplier's capability, um, which, I don't know, that's not good. You've paid for the rest of those multipliers. You should, should use them. Um, so we came up with this scheme to be able to compute an entire 9 by 9 bit complex multiplier in one 27 bit multiplier um, so we can do those four Cartesian multiplications um, inside that one correlator uh, multiplier um, so you've got your Cartesian bits here and you can work out how to construct your 27 bit number on each side and then you can use these four regions in grey um, to compute the partial products of your complex multiply um, and then luckily uh, the b uh, the p b times c plus the a times d are in the same columns in your multiply so they get added immediately and that's that's very nice so it's only left for you to compute the ac which ends up at the low end of the multiplier and add that to the BD uh, to get this term. Um, so, but that was unsigned and unsigned is not what we have. We have these pesky signed numbers. Um, so you get all of these funny corner cases where if you've got a negative number in one and a negative number in another and they cancel and stuff um, and you got your your uh, assign extension for your numbers they go out through the results so you have to try and back out all of those those effects but it ten, turns out that was relatively easy to correct those results um, um, so our final complex multiply and accumulate block that we put into the FPGA uh, looks something like this in a Stratix 10 um, so we've got our multiply here which does our complex multiplication we get this result out the bottom. We can break it apart because FPGAs are cool and it costs nothing to do and do our subtraction to get our um, our real term and then we can look at the sign bit from our imaginary term and subtract that from our real term because that sign bit sign extended through this uh, BD term. Um, and then the same here, we can take the sign bit from the AC term that caused the sign extension to go all the way through here and um, add it to our accumulators um, where we accumulate our results. Uh, um, so this was this was critical to get the the correlator together in in the uh, into the FPGA. Um, it was it was fundamental in making the SKA happen. Um, so we can we can use a few flip-flops and a few lookup tables around to make our, our adders, and we can run it very fast. Um, so we require a 500 megahertz speed for the correlator, and we can well exceed that. Um, so we've got lots of, of slack in our timing to play with. Um, and yeah, lots of details in this paper that we published a long time ago um, in 2018. And I'm quite proud of this piece of work because it is something that's actually lasted in the SKA uh, for more than a couple of years. My other good ideas seem to get circumvented uh, reasonably quickly. Um, how am I going for time, Nicholas? <laughs> Five? Okay. I'll talk about this quickly. Um, so we have to transport our results back from the correlator to the science data processor um, and as you do you just say oh we want floating point numbers and um, how big should they be I don't know I'll use a double um, and that seems to be the way that most people think about numbers I'll just make it big enough and then I don't have to care um, but 
sending that data across a network is expensive and the output of our correlator is 6400 gigabit ethernet links um, running at 90 percent capacity to the science data processor um, and in the original design of the correlator the correlator was sitting out in the Karoo desert and the science data processor which 700 kilometers distant in in Cape Town um, so that's a long, long way to transport a lot of data and maybe you don't have to transport all of those extra bytes um, and those bytes probably just represent quantization noise. Um, so I did a bunch of work and came up with these plots that basically said actually we only need an 11 or 12 bit signed integer to, to transport that data. Um, and for the low... So the low correlator um, was down here at less than 8 bits um, to transport their visibilities from uh, from Murchison another eight 900 kilometres to Perth. Um, so I said, well, actually we don't need to use these 32-bit complex numbers. Um, we only need to use these 10-bit, these 11-bit numbers. And uh, I sort of settled well. I thought, well... They want cop. They want floating point because they're floating point people, and GPUs do floating point stuff. So I'll give them sixteen bit complex half precision floats. Um, so I submitted an engineering change proposal, and um, the answer that came back was, "Yeah, that's great. Um, can you do both?" Um, which was yeah, not what I want. FPGAs are great, but it's nice to have a static configuration. Uh, so they didn't really trust me. Um, so I did some more work, and and um, this is an accumulation over uh, 30,000 visibilities output from my correlator, um, looking at how, how accumulating that random number um, converges. So you have these standard deviation lines that, that converge, so you average a average a random number you'll converge towards the real mean um, so the correct answer the real mean here is one third um, shows that because you can't represent it in, um, in binary and a 64 bit floating point precision answer is here and if I compute it um, using 8 bit precision then you get this funny wiggly line if you go down to 7 bits then you have this brown line that is obviously wrong so that's gone and diverged it's not enough precision um, eight bits you can probably get away with nine bits is a little bit better uh, which is the red line and then above nine bits you're basically tracking the the double precision float um, answer um, and they still weren't convinced so I did some work with um, Anthony Griffin at AUT he had a MATLAB model of the entire telescope end to end um, including all of the imaging imaging algorithms um, so we we said okay so if we set the, the precision of the input well, at the point between the correlator and the science data processor when we said oh if we do quarter precision uh, uh, in F8, um, what does the image look like? What is the noise any worse? And at yeah, eight bits precision floating point, um, it's it's not as good. the The error, the mean squared error, is is not great. Um, but if we go to half precision, then the mean squared error follows the the double precision stuff again um, so I thought that was a very cool cool result uh, but I still have to do 32 bits uh, floating point operations um, so battle still to be still to be won um, so looking to the future uh, multi-core world 2025 um, we're currently going through a technology refresh um, so gone are the Stratix 10 and uh, in come the new Agile X FPGA, um, so another another process node better. Um, it'll approximately halve the number of FPGAs we need, and and we'll also on top of that get um, 
uh, some power savings. Um, we moved from DDR4 to HBM, which is awesome. Um, and we're going from our custom custom design boards to COTS boards. Um, and at the same time, um, we've also got the contract to do the Ulmer correlator upgrade. Um, so Ulmer is this telescope down here um, at 5,000 meters in Chile. Um, yeah, 66 dishes, I think. Um, and yeah, that's going to be a cool project. They're going from 6 gigahertz of bandwidth um, to 60 gigahertz of bandwidth. So huge increase. Um, so that it, they'll do some more amazing science. Um, um, yeah, last year in my, my talk, I talked about Slim, um, um, my very cut down version of Ethernet. Um, that's gone bye bye, unfortunately, which makes me sad. And we've gone to um, 400 gigabit Ethernet. Um, but I'm pretty sure that my 9 bit correlator will, will live on um, until the, the AI guys. Uh, build a new FPGA chip that does floating point 16 and there's a million multipliers in the chip and we'll probably shift to that. Um, yeah, thank you very much.